I really want to do the Isaiah study from yesterday and today, so I'm going to do a Speedy Gonzales. Um, so Isaiah 54 from yesterday to 57. 54 is talking to Israel. It's the restoration of Israel, and it's during the time that they're in captivity. So God's telling them in advance, how are you going to make it through when you're in a time of desperate situation? And this is for us too. We're in a time of despair, desperate, when things look like we're in captivity. This is what God says. And it's telling them, but he's telling us. Sing, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into a loud and joyful song in Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, you who have been in labor, because we're, they've been suffering. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband, says the Lord. Enlarge your house, build an addition. Spread out your home and spare no expense, for you will soon be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will occupy other nations and resettle the ruined cities. So this is basically telling them and us, when you're in despair, when you're in captivity, when you're going through something hard, worship, 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 sing worship songs, put on the worship song. Belt it out, says John Corson. Um, build your addition. That means do the work now. When you're in your captivity or in struggling, do the work, you know, read your word, go to church, um, do the um, work of the ministry, whatever it is, just keep plugging away, keep doing it because you're doing it in anticipation of what's coming. So I gave an example of somebody who was like digging ditches, digging ditches um, in anticipation of the water coming to fill them. And then the water came. And so he said, you build a ditch before it even starts to rain. And then the Lord will bring on the blessing. Um, so it says, fear not, you will, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There is no more disgrace for you. You will no longer remember the shame of your youth or the sorrows of your widowhood. For your cradle will be your husband. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. For your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of all the earth, um, for the Lord has called you back from grief as though you were a young wife abandoned by your husband, says the Lord. Um, so this is a good reminder because a lot of people say, oh, the God of the Old Testament, he's so awful, he's so mean. I like the New Testament, Jesus. Well, listen to God, the Father's heart. He calls himself the husband of Israel. So he was saying, even though you're going to be in captivity for these 70 years, I, your creator, will be your husband. So God the Father considers him a husband to Israel. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. He is your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of all earth. For he's going to call you back from your grief as though you were a young wife abandoned by your husband. Um, it says, for a brief moment I abandoned you, with, but with great compassion I will bring you back. In a burst of anger I turned my face away for a little while. They turned his back a little bit for a little while and they got taken by the Babylonians because they divorced him. Really, they committed adultery on him uh, because they, they worshipped idols. Um, it says, in a burst of anger, I turned my face away for a little while, but with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, so, says the Lord, your, um, uh, your Redeemer. Just as I swore in the time of Noah that I would never again let the flood cover the earth, so I now swear that I will never again be angry or punish you. For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing, or it's another word, my covenant of peace, will never be broken to the Lord um, who has mercy on you. So that's his heart for Israel, for Israel. It says, O storm battered city, troubled and desolate, I will rebuild you with precious jewels and make your foundation from, from lapis lazuli. I will make your towels of sparkling rubies, your gates of shining gems, and your walls of precious stones. I will teach you all your children and they will enjoy great peace, his shalom peace. You will be secure under a government that is just just and fair. Your enemies will stay far away. You will live in peace and terror will not come. So this is, is a, a reference to the new Jerusalem and the millennium period. When Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem, he's going to reign and he was going to teach children. He's going to have a fair and just government. But it's also a future prophecy to the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 of 1821 and the new Jerusalem is going to come down and it's going to be made of precious stones and the foundation stones. So if you read Revelation 21 verse 18 through 21, you'll get this that's going to come after the millennium, the new Jerusalem comes down. Um, if any nation comes to fight you, it is not because I sent them. So um, during after 1948, all these nations that are warring against Israel, it's not God who's sending all these people or during Armageddon, the nations that come in to attack um, Jerusalem. Um, it says it's not going to be I that sent them. So it's not um, these nations are going to come on their own. But this is God's promise to them. Whoever attacks you will go down in defeat. And this is after the 1948 when Israel became a nation. This was God's promise. These nations that are going to come against you in the future, they're not going to be from me. And if they attack you, they're going to go down in defeat. And look what happened during the Six-Day War in 1967. 
they came against Israel and they were defeated. In Ezekiel 38, when these five nations come against Israel, they're going to be defeated by the Lord God. Um, so it's his promise to them. He says, I have created the blacksmith who fans the coals beneath the forge and makes the weapons of destruction. I've created the armies that destroy. Um, so it says, God said, I'm in charge of these um, armies. I'm the one who controls them. It says, in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. So no weapon will prosper. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These are the benefits enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. And that is an awesome for us too. That is a great prayer in scripture that we can pray over ourselves that that no weapon formed against us will prosper that that you will silence every voice raised to accuse us these benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the lord their vindication will come from from me says the lord also a prayer for president trump and um, benjamin netanyahu lord jesus we pray that no weapon formed against them will prosper that you will silence every voice raised up to accuse them that these are the benefits enjoyed by the servants of the lord their vindication will come from you O lord we pray um, so I'm going to stop there so I can load them easily. All right. This is chapter 55 and 56. This is God's invitation to the Gentiles. So once Israel rejected, um, um, Jesus, then the message went out to the Gentiles. And this is God's heart for the Gentiles. He said, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. If you have no money, um, even if you don't have any money, he said, my invitation to the Gentiles, um, to you for salvation is free. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength or pay for food that does not give you good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest foods. Come with me, to me with ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the aim feeling love I promised David. So this is a message to the Gentiles. All of my love I had for David and his line, I'm going to give to you freely. See how I used, used him to display my power among the people. I made him a leader among the nations. So David's leadership and kingdom was so awesome. It was a, it was a um, witness to the Gentile nations. You also will command nations you do not know, and people unknown to you will become running to obey, because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. So Israel as a nation, he has, God has made glorious to be a witness to the nation, but also Jesus, who is, is, is a type of Israel, Jesus is glorious, and he will draw people to himself. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish every thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord, and he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to God, for he will forgive generously. And then this is God saying to, the, to Israel, I know you think that my salvation is only for the line of David, but it's not. You're being used to be bring the Gentile nations to yourself. So when he's talking about this next passage, he's talking about my mercy. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are, not, are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He said, my mercy is not like your mercy. Because sometimes we'll think, well, that person is beyond being saved. That person is too far gone. And God's saying, no, my mercy, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, and my ways beyond your ways. Um, so we have to remember that, that God's mercy is for all. Nobody is, with, is too far gone. And it says, let the rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It's the same for my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. Remember, God's word is like a seed. I, it will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. That's where we get the, um, the scripture. It's translated a different way into my word will never come back void. It will produce what I want it to accomplish. So um, one of the things to remember with John Corson said is speak scripture to people, plain scripture. So if you've got people in your life and you say, I don't know how to witness to these people, send them a scripture verse. The word never comes back void. God will use it to accomplish his purposes. So say, thinking about you today, send them a scripture. Let the Bible speak for itself. Um, it says, then you will, you will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be everlasting sign of his power and love. So we send out the word as a seed. God plants it. it all this great um, trees um, of blessings will rise up. This is what the Lord says. Be just and fair to all. Do what is right and good. For I'm coming soon to rescue you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And to display my righteousness among you. Blessed are those who are careful to do this. Blessed are those who honor my Sabbath days of rest and keep themselves from doing wrong. Now, one of the things is that John Carson said, Jesus is our Sabbath. 
He is our rest every day. So we don't have just one day of rest. Jesus, after he came and died on the cross, he's our Sabbath. He's our everyday Sabbath. And so this is God's heart to the Gentile nations. It says, don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord. So people who are out there who want to be with the Lord, they said, the Lord will never, um, oh, we don't say uh, those people. The Lord will never let me be a part of his people. And don't let the eunuchs say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future. So those that are too far gone, don't let them say, hey, the Lord will never let me be a part of his people, or I'm so messed up that um, I have no future. He said, no, for this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what it pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. So what was happening is eunuchs could not come in to the holy place to pray. They would be they would be left out on the outside. And so God says, no, 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 don't let the people, don't let them stay on the outside and think they have no future. He said, I'm going to open up for them um, the walls of my house. And I'm going to give them a memorial and a name far greater than any earthly sons or daughters could give. Because remember, you just couldn't have earthly kids. He said, I'm going to give them a name that is everlasting. It's never going to disappear. They're going to be called my child. I'm going to put my name on them. Um, it says, I will also bless foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not des desecrate the Sabbath day of rest, and who hold fast to my covenant. I will bring them into my holy mountain of Jerusalem. I will fill them with joy of my, uh, in my house of prayer. So God calls his house a house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer to all the nations. Now, this is one of the things why Jesus got so upset when he went in and all the money changers were there and he knocked them over. And Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer. It was because where they had put the marketplace was in the court of the Gentiles. The old um, temple in Jerusalem had a certain area that was only for gentle Gentiles. They couldn't go beyond a certain place. And that it should have been the court of the Gentiles where they could pray well, the Jews and um, the Pharisees had turned that into a marketplace. So that's why Jesus was upset. He goes, hey, my temple was supposed to be a place where the Gentiles could come and pray also. And you you blocked them from coming. And so he said, my house should be a house of prayer. And Jesus got mad. So that's what that means. For the sovereign Lord who brings back the outcasts of Israel says, I will bring others too, besides my people Israel. The God's heart is for all the nations. I'm going to bring others too, besides my people Israel. And so this is what the next part is for a warning for those who are going to denounce God, who those who are going to denounce Jesus. It says, come wild animals of the field, come wild animals of the forest, come and devour my people. For the leaders of my people, the Lord's watchmen, his shepherds are blind and ignorant. So this is a warning to us um, who are um, in the leadership, um, but also who are supposed to be sharing God's word um, to pastors, um, to Bible teachers. It says, for the, um, it says, for the leaders of my people, the Lord's watchmen, his shepherds, are blind and ignorant. They are like silent watchdogs that give no warning when danger comes. So they're like a watchdog that's fallen asleep or they're, they're silent when the warning should be given. They don't give any warning when danger comes. They love to lie around sleeping and dreaming like greedy dogs. They never are satisfied. They are ignorant shepherds. These are pastors that are ignorant or leaders, Bible teachers, even us that we're supposed to be sharing the word. They're ignorant shepherds all following their own path and intent on personal gain. So it's all that like prosperity gospel, worried about personal gain. They say, come, let's have some wine and have a party. Let's get drunk. Then tomorrow we'll do it all over again and have an even bigger party. So the, the pastors that are supposed to be teaching and the, and the religious teachers, and, or not religious, but Bible teachers, if they're giving no warning, they're not warning the people of what's coming, then God's saying, um, it says, come wild animals of the field, come wild animals of the forest, come and devour my people. For the leader, the, for the leaders of the people, the, the watchmen, they're his shepherds, they're blind and ignorant. And so one of the things that was that is sad is 98% of pastors no longer teach on prophecy. 78% of pastors no longer believe that the word is the inherent word of God. And so these people are ignorant um, shepherds and they're, um, they're blind and ignorant watchmen. And they're letting the people be led astray. Um, all right, so that's that, that one. Bye.